Nature is amazing, efficient and above all sustainable, and a growing number of designers and scientists are looking more closely than ever to the natural world for inspiration. Biomimetics is extracting good design from nature. It's learning all the various ways that nature can interact with its environment and survive. Because most of the work begins in biology departments, we then need to involve engineering, physics, and the physical sciences. So once those two groups come together, that's when we really have biomimetics. At the newly opened Darwin Centre in London's Natural History Museum, 17 million insect and 3 million plant specimens are providing a rich platform for research into everything from malaria treatments to transport, even credit card security. Are we finding new, th new structures and we're interested in the way that they do interact with water or air um, or light, for example. Butterflies have wings with about 100,000 scales. And if we look, we'll find nanostructures there that interact with light waves to produce iridescent colours, in the same way as holograms on credit cards, for example. By replacing air with acetone, you will see how the blue turns to green, and as the acetone evaporates, air comes back and the blue colour returns. It may be an obvious model for sustainability and efficiency, but until now, the natural world has been largely ignored by the commercial one. But that's changing. BMT Defence Services, which specialises in naval design and engineering, has formed a symbiotic relationship with its neighbour, the University of Bath, and together they're coming up with some fascinating new technology. Underwater um, uh, animals turn into fish and the like tend to be very quiet as well as being very energy efficient. So you can see the, the defence applications in terms of stealthiness, in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of lack of support on uh, returning to port, returning to a home vessel, being very attractive. The best propellers there are are about 70% efficient, power in to thrust out. Fish on the same scale are 95 to 98% efficient. So you're able to generate a whole lot more efficient use. Now, convert that into a motor design and you get less emissions. BMT sponsors projects at the university with a view that the results may one day have applications in the market. Hoping to learn potentially profitable lessons from evolution, researchers have drawn inspiration from creatures as diverse as birds that can swim underwater to the mangrove-dwelling knife fish. And this is a, a kind of a fish that, that holds its body rigid and has a fin on the bottom of its belly. And it's one of the only fishes that can swim backwards just as easily as it can forward. So that says to us, ha, maneuverable. So we've, we've gone and made a machine that, that uh, mimics that propulsion mechanism. The Robo Puffin is a, is a different machine, uh, again, based on the same hull. But in this case, what we have is a set of flapping wings. And so the idea is to look at, at the efficiency of things like penguins and puffins. We have an oscillating motion, so the wing is moving up and down. Another company is working to a similar model based on spider research at Oxford University. Orthox develops medical devices to repair and regenerate damaged knee cartilage. The secret weapon? Silk. And to produce it, they're using some of the same processes spiders use to spin webs. Although it's only the tenth the thickness of, of human hair, um, if you had um, a spider silk fibre which was the thickness of a pencil, and a web constructed of, uh, of fibres that size, then you could stop a jumbo jet with it. Spiders obviously use their webs to catch insects, not passing jets. But, given the properties of various silks, it's no wonder scientists like Nick Scare are interested in their potential. With experts predicting a 500% rise in knee replacement operations over the next two decades, it's clearly a potentially huge and profitable market. Yet funding still proves elusive. We can't acknowledge too greatly the, the, uh, the help that the World and Trust have given us in getting this far. But funding in general for biomimetics um, is, is a challenge. The medical area is always a problematic one because of these huge timescales from the first idea uh, to ideally then a patent and then the proof of principle and proof of concept <laughs> and then the proof of safety and then the proof of, of um, um, basically a product that can make money. But the idea is catching on. One study found the number of patents involving biomimicry had nearly doubled in the last 20 years. But there's still plenty of work to be done. We're not going to make super tankers swim like fish. You know, that's not the point. Well, biomimetics is probably not going to um, completely save the world, but there are many, many um, cases that we come across all the time where we do see potential application. We see real potential. 
Um, the trick, I suppose, is working with just the right company. We won't get it right first time. Um, that the balance is probably to understand where you, where you can and where you can't replicate what nature has done. Uh, understand the limitations of materials, be they, be they naturally occurring materials or man-made, and to uh, limit your expectations of biomimicry within, that, within those bounds. After all, the wonders of nature didn't appear overnight, and this science also needs time to evolve. Biologists and engineers still have a lot of catching up to do. About 500 million years should do the trick.